This is quite an extraordinary moment in time uh, for women and for diversity and inclusion. Um, I've sort of got goosebumps thinking about the past year uh, and looking ahead to the, the current year. Uh, this began with four of us in that talking circle comparing notes about what it's like to build a career as women and executives in, uh, in venture capital and uh, trying to be uh, strong in achieving women in what felt very much like a man's world. And here we are with an RSVP list of 130 off of a list of invited over 240 uh, coming together um, in sisterhood, uh, wanting to really uh, celebrate and, and support each other's achievements to maximal potential uh, in this incredible industry that we're in, where we're, uh, we're taking our energies, our talents, our education, our skills, uh, leaving often friends, family behind in order to, um, to advocate for hope, health, well-being for, for others. And we're privileged to do that as a career and ever more privileged to do that as women in venture capital in the healthcare industry uh, and to have so many more in our ranks. This is a very inclusive gathering. We want the pipeline to reflect associate all the way to managing general partner in funds uh, because it truly is a sisterhood. Uh, and it's a collective to support each other um, and, and, uh, and really transforming the, the industry for, for the collective good. So thank you and cheers to, cheers to all of Cheers to all of you. Um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to think that we in healthcare also uh, have a bit of a leg up on our compatriots in the tech industry and how we come together uh, to innovate and, and to support and that we bring a bit more inclusiveness and maturity uh, and long-term perspective uh, to, to this business. And uh, <laughs> I think we do it better. I hope we keep doing it better and better and, and, uh, and, uh, and celebrate each other. Uh, you are hosted tonight by my sisterhood at Canaan, Wendy, Julie, Janet, uh, Colleen, who just had her first child, is not with us uh, in person, but very much in spirit. Uh, but you're also, it's not just, this, this kind of a thing takes a village, and getting all of you here takes, uh, takes more than, than just us. We also have the women of AbbVie Ventures, Takeda Ventures, and Gemini Advisor, so hats off to, to you. And then as we moved from the ranks of our small foursome to seven some to you know, 10 to a dozen to two dozen, we outgrew every large restaurant private room in San Francisco. <laughs> and so we were faced with a choice. Do we cut the ranks back to some sort of subset of this group, maybe only biopharma or digital health or some such, or do we turn to the community and see, can we dip into some pockets and get sponsorship for this dinner and get an extraordinary event space like this? So I want to acknowledge, you know, Brenda from uh, Chode has been with us as a sponsor from the very beginning. So hats off to, to strong support. But this year, we're also underwritten by ICR, by Goldman Sachs, by Russell Reynolds. The fabulous wine you're drinking is from SVB and Clearview. Uh, so we have a, a lot to, to appreciate. So. I also want to mention two more um, uh, important details. Uh, we're uh, company tonight with my best friend forever, Bree Sanchez, who has uh, this extraordinary talent for capturing ideas and conversation graphically to let the right and left brained uh, community be uh, both included in, in an event like this. So she is scribing today uh, a conversation that we're about to have and has also uh, created a board which will be out in the lobby shortly uh, asking you each to make a very concrete pledge in support of each other because all of this momentum and talk and this drumbeat uh, will only transform this industry if we make concrete action. So I'd like to ask you to take a pledge and join in signing the pledge to do at least one thing this year in 2018 to help elevate a fellow woman into the C-suite or onto a board of directors because until we're 50-50 in those hallowed rooms, the world's not gonna change. So without any further ado, I want to invite up to the stage um, a new friend, but uh, quickly becoming a good friend, Maria Idol. Uh, Maria was the founder of Nike's foundation and then has founded Girl Effect. And through her incredible advocacy on behalf of girls and women, she was also tapped to be really the, the orchestrator for this self-governing, self-amassed uh, uh, movement called Time's Up that you might have heard about. Uh, it was very much featured on its, uh, its celebrated debut at the Golden Globe Awards on Sunday. So Maria, would you come up and we'll have a chat? But I want to begin with, Maria, who are you? What's, what's with uh, starting the Nike Foundation Initiative and Girl Effect? Will you tell us just a little bit about uh, your inspiration and your work there? So funny when you say, who are you? It's like the first thing that came to my mind. What are you doing a here? strong, badass woman. <laughs> um, 
like all of you. Um, yeah, it's just the energy of coming into a room of great women like this is, is really inspiring to me. And I just came from a group of women in LA where we were preparing for a big meeting tomorrow with the Time's Up group. So uh, it's just so fun. I, I was just saying that I remember the first time I went to Davos the World Economic Forum, and I tried to get into, I was trying to get into one of the rooms, and someone said, I'm so sorry, there's no spouses. Uh, and I said, well, that's okay, because I don't have a spouse, because I was single. And the person didn't quite understand the joke. So anyway, I just love being in these rooms with incredible, powerful women who are just making the world great. And um, so that's really who I am, in my essence. Uh, is a woman who wants to see great women be fantastic. Um, I created the Nike Foundation um, 20 years ago when I went to Nike to uh, found corporate responsibility for the company. Uh, Nike had been through a tough chapter around sweatshops and they recruited me uh, to set up corporate responsibility, which was corporate governance and uh, all the various functions. And at the time, there wasn't even a title of corporate responsibility. We joked about what my title should be at the time, but now, of course, today, everybody has social responsibility, corporate responsibility. Yeah, standard operating procedure now, but it certainly wasn't then, and we had to define uh, what it meant. And because it was a defining moment for the company, I had a lot of ability to be quite bold and, um, and really challenge a company to do something big. And I just challenged the board. I said, if we're going to do something with our foundation, let's just not have a nice foundation. Let's do something bold and audacious and that really leverages what we can be as a company. And um, so I felt like, well, the biggest issue of our time is poverty, still is and was then. And if we wanted to do something about poverty, what would be the highest point of leverage we could engage with in the company? And 20 years ago, all of the energy that we're all feeling right now, and you couldn't fill a room. I'm sure all of you, like you said, there were four of you and then there were more. Uh, you couldn't fill a room with women. Um, and so the issue of women was, uh, women was kind of seen as a side issue or a kind of a nice to have. Um, and I ended up spending time, I could have focused on anything with the Nike Foundation, cancer, any city gangs, you know, it really the, the field was open. And I talked to everybody from Nobel laureate economists to taxi drivers, what would you do with the Nike Foundation and if you wanted to focus on um, poverty and kept coming around to women. Uh, but then uh, the, the biggest insight was that before they're women, they're girls. And if you catch her at adolescence, before she's HIV positive, pregnant, married, burdened with every aspect of poverty that in, impedes her from succeeding, you could hit the highest pivot. And um, so everyone thinks we actually chose adolescent girls as a focus more because it was a women's issue, but actually it was stark economics. If you could get that pivot, to move, you could move economies, societies, political systems, uh, and truly transform the world. And that is what we are see ha seeing happening uh, in, in reality in the world today. And so Girl Effect has been profoundly successful. It's global. It's uh, gotten a tremendous amount of recognition. Um, maybe share just a couple of three sort of insights or truths about girl and women that have come from that, that have fueled some of the other activism that you're doing on behalf of women. So we made pretty much every mistake, you know, when we started the work. Um, you go out and say, okay, we're going to transform the lives of 250 million adolescent girls in poverty. And so we're like, oh, it's, it's, it's economic empowerment, isn't it? Oh, it's education, it's girls' education, it's safety, it's voice, it's rights. And, and so we, we narrowed it down to five of the essential things. And then we thought dosage and duration. And, what, and we, we thought we were so clever about trying all these different combinations of what would transform a girl's life sustainably. Not for a moment, not for those moments in the classroom, not for a moment when she's in the health clinic, not for a moment when she's safe, but how could you do it to actually have it be sustainable? And we kept failing, and it was so frustrating because it seemed so illogical if we, if we did that. And um, I was in a fishing village in Kenya on a lake that was being overfished, and girls had to trade their body for sex to feed the family. So your day consisted of trading your body for sex to bring fish home for the family. So it's an actually completely inescapable economic uh, model. So we created um, agriculture and pumps and everything, and it was just so exciting. We were going to take away this economic burden of having to trade your body for fish. And, um, and then I went back uh, after the program was very successful 
to find out that they were still training their body for sex. And I was like, how could that possibly be? They don't need to anymore. They have the vegetables. They have the chicken farming. We did all that. Um, and what the girl said is, it's just the way it is in our community. That's what you have to do. And so then the big insight hit that it's about social norms. And normative behavior determines so much. So we realized that you had to do two things, ignite her and transform her world. Give her a sense of strength and knowledge and, and, and self-worth, but at the same time, create an environment around her that supports her to succeed. And that's the same for boys or girls or any, all of us in this room had some combination of education and safety and health. But you also had an environment that believed that you should go to school, that believed that you could do what you're doing. You had a parent, a friend, a teacher, someone who said, you know, Nina, you're pretty darn smart. You're going to be great, and that's why you've become the person that you are. So it's no different, really. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing happen today. So the, the, the normative behavior in a few uh, towns south of us uh, got a lot of attention this year with um, the, the relaunch, really, of the Me Too movement, because, of course, that goes way, way, way back. Um, and it's been a, a privilege to have a little bit of a window onto that group. And, and what I would say, this is the, the Time's Up gathering, and I was able to attend one um, uh, last month, that uh, it's an audacious uh, vision. Uh, what was absolutely true of the group is that there's a, a, an insane amount of energy to try to reshape those norms and to turn the anger and the disappointment and the hurt into to activism. But what, what really is Time's Up? And how should this group be uh, introduced to it to the extent that they haven't, haven't uh, been exposed? Well, it's, it's, it's been very fascinating. And when you said there were four of you and then a dozen and, and it grew, uh, so when the Harvey Weinstein uh, news hit, there were a group of women in Hollywood who basically said, this has got to stop. This is so huge. And so they asked me to just come and moderate a conversation. And there were about 23 or four of, I think it was, in the room with no agenda, no particular form, no sense of where it was going to grow, other than a very clear intention that it's got to stop. And that there was, this was a new moment and that we had to do something different. And we, and you experienced it, Julie Sutherland, uh, Sunderland experienced it. We basically broke into groups and said, come up with topics, come up with our areas where we know we have to make progress, self-organize, self-lead, and let's see what we can do. And then we will commit to just coming back every week, doggedly, until we make real progress. And in, in an incredibly short amount of time, an extraordinary thing has happened. Uh, we came back to the second meeting, and I was frankly super skeptical. So we came back the next week, and I'm like, okay, let's have each of the, everyone report back what they did. And it was like, I was just completely born, blown away because not one woman said, oh, I, was so, I didn't get to it, I, you know, I had this other thing happened. Everyone came back and had done twice what they had, three times what they said they were going to do um, from the previous meeting. And that energized everyone. And then it turned into um, very simple things like people didn't know what their basic rights were. People didn't even know what defined sexual harassment. When should I bring a case forward? When should I not? What should I tell young women who are asking me? Um, we realized we needed to uh, form a legal defense fund because there's no funds for any woman who is not a person with any, you know, farm workers and hospital workers and the other women who are not, and even the women in Hollywood, uh, Legal Defense Fund. And, and we have raised $16 million already uh, for the Legal Defense Fund, which has been just shocking. We have donations from 60 countries. Um, and. Uh, we, and then we have these t-shirts, Time's Up t-shirts that we created, and we, we have women in Pakistan uh, buying t it's, it's pretty extraordinary. It's touched a nerve. And so what, what, it, what it is is that it's a, a self-organizing, leaderless organization. And that's what's so fascinating to me. Because, um, because I wasn't from the industry, I was really adamant that I was not leading. I was enabling. I was enabling the group to be great. And um, what happened is, it, and when you have movie stars in the room that naturally people will gravitate to seeing as leaders, but we had Oprah come to the meeting. And what we didn't do is have Oprah come and be the VIP. She sat at the table with us and she participated in the meeting. 
Um, tomorrow we have Gloria Steinem coming. It's a surprise, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, so exciting. I'm so excited. Um, and um, she's going to give us perspectives of how not to fail and what mistakes not to make at this critical <laughs> moment where we have momentum and we've got to make sure we don't lose the momentum and that we really carry through. So, um, so we've created a legal defense fund. We've created a commission, uh, which is very, with the heads of all the biggest uh, studios. And then we have 13 working groups that are all individually activating. Um, so now it's just just sort of exploded beyond our dreams, actually. Well, what's remarkable is, I mean, one can cynically say, okay, 60, 75 A-list Hollywood actresses who are speaking up about this issue and very cynically say, you know, you don't have pay parity, but your contract for your leading role is still a, a one that doesn't uh, uh, emanate a, a lot of sympathy. But to have them stand up and address this group and say, you tell us what to do. We appreciate that we have voice and we have influence and reach but make us, I think literally the term used is make us your soldiers, although ironic that it's war uh, yes. metaphors yeah. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the battle. But that was one of the, the signs as well as the tremendous momentum of the Legal Defense Fund and the inclusive effort to involve other industries that's given me some hope that this is not just that, that moment that then will fade. But what, what would you say to this group as invitations to either get involved or to have confidence that this is gonna be momentum and a sustained and not a flash, flash in the pan in response to yeah, I'm, I'm very worried. Um, I, you know, the news cycles get all excited and then the thing passes. And so um, this moment is really important. Um, and one thing that does concern me is that if you, t if you were to, if I could transport you to the meeting of the, of the women that will happen uh, tomorrow, um, they're all on fire and there's a, there is a collective energy that's happening that's giving people strength to do things. And I don't know that that's happening in Silicon Valley. I don't know that's happening in the VC community. I don't know that that's happening across the financial industry. And so I think my hope is that there's an emboldening that occurs um, because women don't want to come forward and um, it is difficult and we've even had the issue where people, women who have come forward are kind of wishing they could go back, you know, because it's like, oh my God, why did I do that? And there's a fear, there's a fundamental fear that women have um, that if you come forward and stand in your strength in this, that it will hurt your career. And I'm sure that the, for those of you who uh, mentor young women, I, I'm just completely overwhelmed at this moment with young women coming to me saying, you know, our head, of, our head of HR was the guy who's actually the problem, so then we took it to the VP of HR, but then he got moved to another department and promoted, you know, and that's happening today. And, um, and then there's also um, survivor guilt. Um, most women who are my age, I'm 55, um, we made it within that environment, so there's things we all developed, these ways of coping or de dealing with it, and kind of, um, so there's a complicitness that people experience. And then there's this massive men fear. Like, men are scared now. They're afraid to say anything. They're afraid to do anything. Young men are afraid about dating and how to be appropriate. So this is an upheaval. And um, we can't lose the moment by letting it be a news story that then died. And so one of the things we talked about today in our, in our meeting is we have to make sure momentum comes from other industries too. So it doesn't look like this is just some entertainment industry problem that's gonna either get cleaned up or not. It, I, it is pervasive and um, it is nuanced. And that's what makes it difficult. Um, there are many things that are blatant and obvious, but then there's so much nuance here. And that's where people get lost, and that's where people get, get scared. So the momentum is key to come from other industries, and then also to take energy from what, what, people, what, 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 what we're doing. And so everything from Time's Up will be being shared so that, yes, you can have a, a working group on pipeline, just like... A, the pledge to help uh, do one thing to help other women get onto boards or into the C-suite. Um, it's extraordinary. If everyone in this room really does do it, you'd be sh it's shocking what it does. When, um, so I think that's what's really key is the individual activism of each of you is what will make the difference. What's, what made Time's Up powerful in the last 48, you know, as we kind of came out, came out was because there was not one person in the group who did not activate. That was something. How many people actually saw the Golden Globes or some replay um, of them? Yeah. 
One of the things that, that really struck me in watching it was as, uh, as individuals were going up to speak or accept a, a prize, and you knew that they were going to give a talk that was in some way speaking to this, the sense of support, the intense emotional support that was really cheering her on, it was especially her on, was really powerful to me. And in a lot of ways, I feel like that's something that can be infectious, is that sense of just have each other's back. Uh, and support, um, and it feels like that's something that's that's not just in that Golden Globe party, but in that whole working group of some two, three hundred women now. Yeah, it's really interesting to go back to the work in poverty that we do with girls in poverty. Um, it's so similar to what happens that when girls succeed, actually, it's when a, it, often a man champions the girl, bro, uh, the brother, the father, the uncle, um, and so there's the need for that support, but absolutely critical is they have to have a sense of collective, a collective force. When they know that a friend, a girl, if they just have one friend or a group, then they will succeed far more. That's another part of the, of the learnings that you asked me about in the beginning. The other thing we learned was this social norm, but then we also learned the collective power of women. And it's one of the things that Gloria Steinem has emphasized as we've had private conversations with her to get advice is that women do not use their collective power. Um, and the power in this room is extraordinary, and I bet you haven't tapped into it. Each of you is doing your work. Each of you has have friends, and you support each other, I bet. And, but, but if you actually thought, what could the collective power of this room do? I bet it's pretty awe-inspiring. What a beautiful note to end on.